Without the ones like you, who work tirelessly to keep things running, everything would suddenly stop. Hospitals, factories, schools, and power plants, they all depend on you. No matter the weather, emergency, or time of day, you're the ones who get it done. At Granger, we're here for you with professional grade industrial supplies. Count on real time product availability and fast delivery. Call clickgranger.com or just stop by. Granger for the ones who get it done. 400 years ago, a trio of tiny kingdoms were perched on some damp islands off the coast of Europe. Within three short centuries, these islands would become the centre of an empire which ruled a quarter of the globe and on which the sun never set. I'm Samuel Hume, a historian of the British Empire, and my podcast Pax Britannica follows the people and events that built that empire into a global superpower. Learn the history of the British Empire by listening to Pax Britannica everywhere you find your podcasts, or go to pod.link slash pax. Hi, this is Scott. If you're a fan of the ancient world, please help us get the word out. Like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter, and rate the series on iTunes. Thanks again for listening. The Ancient World Bloodline Episode B-13, Zealot When Drusilla was six, a Roman general worked magic in the deserts of Gaetulia. Stranded beyond the Atlas Mountains, without water and surrounded by rebels, Gnaeus Hosidius Geta prayed for rain, and rain began to fall. Awed by his power, the Mori chieftain, a man named Salabus, immediately came to terms. No one present could have guessed that a random storm would end the four-year rebellion. All they knew was that it proved beyond a doubt that the gods were on Rome's side. Even if Drusilla never learned the details, she'd still recall it as a time of change. Mainly, it meant traveling across the sea and moving to a new city and a new household. The pater familius was a man named Claudius, and the children born to his young wife, Messalina, had been named in the traditional manner. Their five-year-old daughter, Claudia Octavia, was named in honor of Claudius's grandmother, Octavia the Younger. Their three-year-old son was named Tiberius Claudius Caesar Germanicus, but in honor of a recent Roman conquest, he was now simply called Britannicus. Drusilla knew that her own role was unique. Drusilla's father, Ptolemy, had been king of Mauritania. Claudius told her that her father's land had now been adopted by Rome, and his daughter taken under the care of Rome's leading family, which was a nice way to put things, and close enough to the truth. Claudius also told her that Ptolemy had been his cousin, both of them being grandsons of Mark Antony, and that made Drusilla his cousin too. For the better part of the next decade, Drusilla of Mauritania was fostered in the court of the Roman Emperor Claudius. Since both her parents had died while she was still an infant, it was her experience with the Claudians that had shaped her understanding of family, love, loyalty, and honor. That poor, poor girl. Okay, that's a little unfair, and we can at least start with the positives. First and foremost, Caligula was dead, murdered by the Praetorian Guard in collusion with the Senate. Oddly enough, the final straw had come when he'd planned a permanent move to Alexandria, which kind of brings the whole Mark Antony thing full circle. On his death, the Senate hoped to restore the Republic, but the military had other plans. Finding the terrified Claudius hiding behind a curtain, the Praetorians proclaimed him emperor and dared anyone to challenge them. The fact that no one did was a pretty ominous sign. Despite everyone's abysmally low expectations, Claudius had shaped up to be a pretty decent emperor, a talented administrator, prolific builder, and military expansionist. 
Along with his annexation of Britannia, Noricum, and Lycia, it was Claudius who'd put an end to the Mauritanian Rebellion, then divided the former kingdom into two Roman provinces. Claudius's affliction, once thought to be mental, had revealed itself to be mainly physical, likely a form of palsy. Over time, he'd learned to manage it in proportion to his confidence. That being the case, it's little surprise its effects had been so pronounced in his youth, with his mother, Antonia Minor, frequently calling him both a monster and an idiot. On the brighter side, being considered mentally deficient had proved an effective cover during the reigns of Tiberius and Caligula. But that was all in the past. The foster father Drusilla came to know was a little quirky and a little nerdy, but otherwise pretty comfortable with himself and treated with respect, even affection, by the Roman people. The Senate could be another matter, but of course Drusilla had little exposure to that side of Roman politics. Within the royal household, Drusilla's main interactions were with her foster family, her slaves and tutors, and Claudius's four main assistants, freed slaves named Narcissus, Pallas, Callistus, and Polybius. Under Claudius, such freedmen were widely used in Roman administration, an effective end run around an obstructionist senate. The imperial court was also home to another notable figure, a Judean prince named Marcus Julius Agrippa. At the time of Drusilla's arrival, in 44 AD, the 17-year-old prince was deep in mourning, since his father, King Herod Agrippa, had recently died. Four years later, Claudius gave the young prince the throne of the minor Syrian kingdom of Chalcis, which he assumed as King Herod Agrippa II. The same year that Agrippa traveled east, 48 AD, a darkness settled on the royal household. Drusilla learned that her foster mother, Messalina, had been put to death by Claudius. Whatever story the children were told must have been pretty heavily redacted. I mean, it probably skipped the part about Messalina being a highly promiscuous serial adulteress who'd actually married her most recent lover, the senator Gaius Silius, behind Claudius's back. No, that's probably not the explanation you'd give three young children who'd just lost their mother. More likely, you'd focus on the part about Messalina conspiring with Gaius Silius to overthrow Claudius, which was also true and a bit more kid-friendly. Of course, either way, their mother was dead, and their father was inconsolable. But later that same year, it was announced that the 58-year-old Claudius was remarrying. Who was the lucky lady? His, um, niece, Germanicus's daughter and Caligula's sister, the 33-year-old Agrippina Minor. The main reason for the move was to strengthen Claudius's Julian ties and hopefully stem the tide of potential coups. Like Caligula, Claudius had assumed the full list of imperial titles and powers on day one. But there was no getting around the fact that he was still the first emperor not adopted by his predecessor and the first elevated by the Praetorian Guard. So forging stronger links to Octavian's family certainly couldn't hurt. The new marriage also helped fill a problematic succession gap. While Claudius's son Britannicus was still only seven years old, Agrippina brought with her an 11-year-old son named Lucius Domitius Ahenobarbus. The Julio-Claudian cat's cradle reaches its height of complexity in the figure of young Lucius, the future emperor Nero. Nero's mother, Agrippina Minor, was the grandchild of Livia's son Drusus and Mark Antony and Octavia's daughter, Antonia Minor. Nero's birth father, Gnaeus Domitius Ahenobarbus, was the only son of Mark Antony and Octavia's other daughter, Antonia Major, through her marriage to a consul named Lucius Domitius Ahenobarbus.
Nero also had two aunts on his father's side, one of whom, Domitia Lepida the Younger, happened to be the mother of Messalina, the wife Claudius had just executed. And yes, I have a helpful family tree posted on the Ancient World website. If nothing else, the ten-year-old Drusilla may have hoped the new marriage would lighten the mood around the palace. But instead, it introduced a pernicious new dynamic, a mounting rivalry between her two foster brothers. Nero was older and more popular with the Roman people, and also had the advantage of Agrippina's constant support. On the other hand, Britannicus had always held his father's deep affection, and it was mainly the matter of his age that made his succession problematic. As time went on, another factor began working in Britannicus's favor, Claudius's growing disenchantment with his new wife Agrippina. As late as 53 AD, the emperor was still hedging his bets. On the one hand, he'd begun making plans to accelerate Britannicus's introduction to public life. On the other hand, he'd arranged for the marriage of the 16-year-old Nero to Britannicus's sister, 14-year-old Claudia Octavia. By 53 AD, Drusilla was also of marriageable age, and one day Claudius told her of his plans. His trusted freedman, Marcus Antonius Pallas, was both secretary of the Roman treasury and close friend of the empress Agrippina. Pallas also had a younger brother named Marcus Antonius Felix. Both had once been slaves in the household of Claudius's mother, Antonia Minor, and, upon being freed, had taken the family name. In addition to being highly regarded by the imperial family, the two brothers were supposedly descended from the ancient Greek kings of Arcadia. While Pallas had become invaluable and insanely wealthy in his current role, Felix had been singled out for the post of procurator of the Roman province of Judea. And what exactly was a procurator? Well, while major Roman provinces were ruled by proconsuls, lesser or subordinate provinces were ruled by procurators, basically civilian CFOs reporting directly to the emperor. This was actually a pretty recent change, one instituted by Claudius. Previously, such minor provinces had been ruled by prefects, military men of equestrian rank reporting to the governors of neighboring provinces. Pontius Pilate was a perfect example, serving a decade as Roman prefect of Judea while reporting to the governor of neighboring Syria. Under Caligula, Roman rule of Judea had been suspended, and the territory given to the Judean king, Herod Agrippa. Since Agrippa's death in 44 AD, a series of three procurators had overseen the province, with Felix now slated to be the fourth. What he needed was a wife of noble birth to accompany him to his new posting. As a great-granddaughter of Mark Antony and descendant of Egyptian, Numidian, and Mauritanian kings, Drusilla seemed the ideal choice. Which is how, in 53 AD, the 15-year-old Drusilla found herself married to a man roughly three times her age and sailing from the empire's core to its volatile eastern fringe. I'd like to picture her using the journey to read a copy of her grandfather Juba's work, Arabia, maybe a parting gift from Claudius. After all, Arabia, along with Strabo's Geographica, did contain the most recent popular descriptions of the Roman East, so it's not a totally crazy idea. But yeah, I admit, it's mostly wishful thinking. What information could Drusilla have learned about Judea from these or other Roman sources? Well, to start with, there was the basic geography. The Jordan River, running from just north of the Sea of Galilee due south to the Dead Sea, divided the province roughly in half. On the western or coastal side, running north to south, lay the territories of Galilee, Samaria, Judea, and Idumea. 
On the eastern or inland side, again roughly north to south, lay the territories of Golanitis, the modern Golan Heights, Traconitis, Batanea, Oronitis, the Decapolis, and Perea. Roman Syria lay to the north, Egypt to the southwest, and Nabatea to the south and east. And yes, I have a helpful map posted on the Ancient World website. The major cities of the province included the ancient Jewish religious, historical, and cultural center of Jerusalem, along with the more recent Hellenistic cities constructed by Herod and his sons. Chief among these was the seaside capital of Caesarea, built by Herod the Great around 20 BC. There was also the city of Sebaste, once the ancient Israelite capital of Samaria, but later expanded, renovated, and renamed by Herod, in honor of his patron Octavian. There was also Caesarea Philippi, built by Herod's son Philip as capital of his northern tetrarchy. And, most recently, there was the city of Tiberias, named after you-know-who and built on the Sea of Galilee by Herod's son, Herod Antipas. The population of Judea was a mix of Jews, Greeks, Samaritans, Syrians, Arabs, and Romans. The Jews, in particular, considered the land their birthright— and centralized worship of their single god, Yahweh, in Jerusalem's temple. For the most part, the Romans took pains to accommodate their religion, as long as they remained peaceful and taxes continued to flow. In 39 AD, the year after Drusilla's birth, the last of Herod's three sons was exiled, and Caligula handed all Judean territories to Herod the Great's grandson, Herod Agrippa. Agrippa was a popular king, especially when he managed to delay the erection of Caligula's statue within the Jerusalem temple until the issue was sidestepped by the young emperor's murder. If anything, Agrippa was even tighter with Claudius. The two rulers were almost the same age and had been raised together in Rome. In fact, in 44 AD, Agrippa was in Caesarea celebrating games in Claudius' honor, when he was struck down by a sudden illness. A few days later, the 54-year-old king was dead. It was in his wake that Claudius had dispatched the series of Roman procurators, of whom Felix was to be the latest. Even if Drusilla were a diligent researcher, this would likely be the extent of her knowledge. What did it leave out? Oh, not much. Only oceans of history, and a chasm of understanding that, in little more than a decade, would erupt in a devastating seven-year war between Judea and Rome. The chasm was largely religious— what to make of a group of non-conforming monotheists who refused to worship Roman emperors as gods. But it was even more about the Jews' understanding of what their own god demanded of them. If the Jews of the age had a defining characteristic, it was their devotion to their scriptures. In addition to their religious role, the scriptures also served as a history, a legal code, and a guide to proper conduct. And what did those scriptures say about their adopted homeland? Quote, As for the towns of these people that the Lord your God is giving you, you must not let anything that breathes remain alive. You shall annihilate them all. Unquote. For most of their history, the Jews had bitterly resisted any foreign presence, let alone foreign control, over any part of Judea. Less than two centuries passed, in this same spirit, the Hasmonean dynasty of the Maccabees had wrestled Judea free from the grip of the Seleucids. But since the dynasty's fall to Pompey's armies in 63 BC, Judea had remained under effective Roman occupation. How various Jewish groups responded to the occupation depended, unsurprisingly, on their social class. 
According to the historian Josephus, the wealthy landowners, generally more accommodating to the Romans, were largely represented by the Sadducee priesthood. The majority of Jews, who felt resentful of the occupation but powerless to resist it, were represented by the Pharisees, typically middle or lower class rabbis and scholars. A third group, the Essenes, basically chose to opt out of the political sphere and concentrate on achieving spiritual purity. All of which brings us to the fourth group, the Zealots. These were the Jews who looked to the example of both the early Hebrews and the Maccabees and felt that violence was sometimes necessary to drive out foreign invaders. The parallel history of Roman Judea, often obscured behind a succession of kings, tetrarchs, and procurators, is largely a story of the revolts of such zealots. And just as there are royal dynasties, there were also Jewish families defined by generations of zealotry. The patriarch of one such line was a bandit chief named Hezekiah. From his base in Galilee, Hezekiah led a large group of Jewish followers in frequent raids against Roman Syria. Eager to make a name for himself and prove his usefulness to the Romans, the governor of Galilee captured and beheaded Hezekiah in 46 BC. That governor, of course, was the future King Herod the Great. While ruling as king, from 37 to 4 BC, Herod managed to keep a pretty tight lid on dissent. And, of course, his many building projects provided plenty of work for the poor and disenfranchised. All of which meant that the conditions for a major revolt didn't arise until after his death. In 4 BC, the unemployed masses returned to their villages, where they proved eager recruits for a new wave of zealot revolutionaries. Foremost among these was Judas of Galilee, son of the earlier bandit chief Hezekiah. In the general atmosphere of lawlessness that followed Herod's death, Judas looted the armory in the major city of Sepphoris, then launched a guerrilla war against the Judean authorities. Judas was hardly alone. A former slave and chief administrator of Herod's named Simon of Perea declared himself king, gathered a group of armed followers, and raided the royal palaces near Jericho. Soon palaces across the province were going up in flames. At the same time, a shepherd boy named Athronges also proclaimed himself king and allied himself with four of his brothers, each of whom commanded a group of armed men. Under Athronges' direction, the improvised army began launching attacks against Roman and Herodian forces. Big guns were obviously needed, and the call went out to the governor of neighboring Syria, Publius Quinctilius Varus. A dozen years from his date with a German ambush, Varus immediately grabbed a couple legions and marched them south. Passing through Galilee, then Samaria, then Judea, Varus crushed revolts, crucified rebels, and burned any towns that resisted. The city of Sepphoris, where Judas of Galilee had obtained his weapons, was singled out for retribution. Its male population was crucified, its women and children sold into slavery, and the city itself razed to the ground. The example had the desired effect, and the leaders of several other rebellions soon surrendered to the Romans. Judas himself remained at large, and would lead another revolt against Roman taxation nearly a decade later. As a very small bright spot, Herod Antipas decided to reconstruct Sepphoris on a lavish scale. The rebuilt city was to be his new capital, a Hellenistic showpiece and home for the Jewish elite. The project, which lasted through the second decade AD, would have certainly monopolized the efforts of the region's carpenters, including those from the nearby village of Nazareth. It also would have rubbed their faces daily 
in the enormous gap between the wealthy Hellenized urban population and the masses of rural poor. The late 20s AD saw another period of unrest. Out of the deserts of Judea came a charismatic preacher, heralding the end of the world and the imminent arrival of the kingdom of God. He traveled the length of the Jordan River, cleansing all who came with ritual baptism. Though John the Baptist committed no overt acts of rebellion, his message of equality and justice and enormous Jewish following was enough to grab the attention of Herod Antipas. Setting aside the more salacious biblical version, the historian Josephus recounts that John was seized, charged with sedition, tried, and imprisoned, eventually dying in the fortress of Machaerus around 30 AD. John's background is a bit of a mystery. He may have been an Essene or even a descendant of temple priests. Far more famous are the actions of a young man who came to him seeking baptism, then launched his own ministry after John's imprisonment and death. Over a period of three years, from 30 to 33 AD, Jesus of Nazareth also preached a message of equality and justice, also raised an enormous Jewish following, and also announced that the kingdom of God was at hand. While the meaning of this phrase could be debated among Jewish scholars, it seemed clear enough to the Roman authorities. Establishing a new kingdom, especially one where the first shall be last and the last shall be first, clearly meant doing away with the existing power structure. The final straw came when Jesus entered Jerusalem with a large group of followers, forced his way into the temple, overturned the tables of the money changers, and freed the sacrificial animals from their cages. To Roman eyes, these actions clearly marked him as another zealot revolutionary. The biblical accounts vary, but any trial was likely perfunctory. During his seven years as prefect, Pontius Pilate had already sent thousands of criminals off to summary crucifixion on Golgotha. Any exchange was probably limited to the one question recorded in all four accounts. Are you the king of the Jews? Regardless of his response, that was the offense of which Jesus was found guilty. Sedition against the Roman Empire. Three years later, in 36 AD, an unnamed Samaritan gathered a large group of armed followers near Mount Gerizim where he promised to show them sacred vessels buried by the prophet Moses. Pilate responded with customary brutality, sending a detachment of soldiers to slaughter them en masse. For some strange reason, this act was deemed excessive, and by Tiberius no less, who recalled Pilate to Rome and then exiled him to Gaul. The violent suppression of popular movements and subsequent kingship of Herod Agrippa kept a lid on unrest for the next few years. But upon Agrippa's death in 44 AD, another group of radicals took up the zealot mantle. The first was a prophet and miracle worker named Theodos, who gathered his followers on the banks of the Jordan River and promised to part it like the Red Sea. The Roman authorities promptly captured and beheaded Theodos and scattered his following. In 46 AD, a more serious revolt was launched by two brothers named James and Simon, the sons of Judas of Galilee and grandsons of Hezekiah the bandit chief. After two years of rebellion, both brothers ended up captured and crucified. The five years since their deaths had seen little improvement. Only the previous year, 52 AD, a bandit chief named Eleazar, son of Danaeus, had begun waging a murderous campaign against the Samaritans, in revenge for an attack on a group of Jewish travelers. In fact, it was his inability to manage this conflict that had cost the previous procurator, Ventidius Cumanus, his job. The slim hope was that, somehow, Felix might do better. 
So this roughly was the state of affairs in Judea when the ship bearing Felix and Drusilla arrived at the provincial capital of Caesarea in 53 AD. Unfortunately for the newlyweds, their tenure would coincide with the formation of the most violent and effective zealot movement yet. Music 